put this downstairs earlier. And we can do a shout out, and I'll shout it back to make sure everybody can hear. Do you have a favorite parable? When you think of the parables of Jesus, what, what jumps out at you? What, what's your favorite? The prodigal son. That was the first one that was shouted out downstairs. Oh. Wow. Now I'm going to tell a little story of the prodigal son. Go on. And other shout outs. Favorite parable? The Good Samaritan. The Good, the good Samaritan. Amen. Good stuff. Amen. And when I was in third grade, I was stitched up at a Good Samaritan Hospital in Hospital, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Very thankful for the Good Samaritan. Amen. What else? Other shout outs. Whither the gay ball. What's that? Whither the gay ball. Amen. The widow with the, 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 the two mites. Amen. Very nice. Tom Reed. Hey, here's my story about the prodigal son. I'm in second grade in my first Sunday school class. And they're telling the story of the prodigal son. Now, how do you tell that to a second grader? Now he takes his father's money and goes and spends it on prostitutes and all this stuff. I'll never forget how they taught it. There was one of those stick drawings, like in the Good News Bible. The prodigal son was sitting there in an ice cream parlor, sipping on an ice cream soda. In my imagination, one after the other. Loose living to a second grade, <laughs> taking your allowance and spending it at the local luncheonette on ice cream sodas. Been there, done that. <laughs> Amen. I had a theory, and it was proven downstairs, and it was proven upstairs. My theory was the parable we're about to read would not be one of the favorites. Let's enjoy it. Let's have fun together this morning. Let's enjoy this parable that, frankly, I would confess, would, would definitely not be one of my favorites. Amen. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon, and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. He said to them, why? Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, There's no one hire us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last, and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, the usual daily wage. Wow. Now on the first day, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last worked only one hour. And you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. We're cool. But he replied, very good. He replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last that the same as I give to you. Stay with me now. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to, you, to me? Or are you envious? because I am generous. This is the literal translation of that last line. Is your eye evil because I am good? Is your 
are I evil? Because I am good. So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Amen. Jesus, please pray with me. God, may this parable really bless us. It's in your name we pray. God, may this parable bless us. In your name we pray. Amen. Point number one. This is going to be fast this morning. I understand why the first workers are upset. This is not a parable on labor negotiations. I understand why the first workers are upset. They watched the last guy get paid $100 for an hour's work. They're doing the math in their heads. If he gets 100 bucks for an hour, my God, we've been here since 7 a.m. My God, we're going to be rolling in it. He'll surely at least give us a bonus, but just $100 an hour. My God, help us. Slid right down. Thank you. We love you, Lord. So it makes sense. It kind of makes sense why they're upset. Point two. We can relate to these guys. Point two. I mean, just what you hear about the sports craziness. You know, like, oh, uh, you know, He's getting this. I got this. Maybe that's an illustration of how I'm saying it again. Two. The landowner. So the first point is the problem. But we can relate to the problem. We understand where they're coming from. A little bit, at least. Second thing. The landowner is being extremely generous. Especially to the last workers hired. This parable is about a gracious and undeserving gift and the reaction to it. These guys at 5 o'clock, I think there's two ages here. There's hunger and there's homelessness. My God, what are they going to do? It's 5 o'clock. They've been standing around all day. They're in desperate shape. They have no food for their families. They're, they're sunk. And then this guy comes along, gives them no guarantees, just says, I'll pay you what's right. And they work. They go in good faith. And their desperateness cannot be overstated. Now, the guys who started the movie, they were much better. These are all day laborers. Problem said, good news. There's an extremely gracious landowner here, as there is an extremely gracious God. Third thing, our response. There's a, let me ask you a question. Maybe this will put this in perspective. You're born and raised in the church. You accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you live all day. You live all your life in the Christian faith. How about that guy in the first year of my ministry? Would you baptize my, my family member? I went over to the house not far from here and I baptized a guy laying in his bed. He accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. I got a question to ask you. Are there two separate heavens? Does the one who knew Jesus all their life from early on do they get to a different heaven than the man who accepted Christ at the last minute of his life? Are there two separate heavens? It's kind of like the same wage, isn't it? Except, by the way, it's not a wage. It's a gift that's not earned or deserved. Third response. There's a serious caution here as well as a call. 
Many years ago, an elderly minister, early in my ministry, said to me, and actually it was Reverend Howard, he said to me, you don't have to hit a home run in every message. Sometimes all you can do is get on base. Just get a single, even walk sometime, you know? And maybe that's what today's message is going to be like, because I don't have anything fancy or profound. I think what I just have is truth and grace from God. It's truth with an opportunity for grace. There's a serious caution here as well as a calling. The caution, 2015. Are you envious because I am generous? Literal translation, the Greek. Is your eye evil because I am good? In our neighborhood growing up on Hillsdale Road, my mom always took in stray cats. We, and, but she had the good ones and the bad ones. We would feed them. One cat we adopted, Pusser we called him, Pusser J. Cat his full name. We had a great cat. But then there was another cat who was Pusser's rival. My mother called him Evil Eye. The Evil Eye was an old Tom cat and he had been in fights and his left eye was just all mangled. And my mom called him Evil Eye because he had an evil eye from the fights he had been in. In the Bible, Evil Eye means ophthalmos paneros. Ophthalmology. That's when you go see an ophthalmologist. Evil Eye. Ophthalmos paneros. One other time, Jesus uses this word. A lot's at stake here. But if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If your eye is evil, if your eye is ophthalmos paneros, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. The caution here is, you don't, I don't want an evil eye. And Jesus asked these early morning workers, is your eye evil? Because I am good. I'm giving these guys the same thing that you got. They're getting in the same heaven as you're going to get into. Is your eye evil? Because I am good. You and I don't want an evil eye, an envious eye, an unhealthy eye, a jealous eye coveting eye, especially regarding gifts of grace that God gives. I looked at a number of different commentaries, and this question was asked. This question is asked of the people who have been in the church all their life, the people who have followed Jesus as your Lord and Savior all your life, people who have worked in the vineyard all your life, people who the sweat has come off your brow that all you can do is just get a towel and wipe it off sometimes. Here's the question. Do you remember the joyful fulfillment of doing your created purpose? Do you remember the joyful fulfillment of doing your created purpose or the mere endurance of the scorching heat? <laughs> do you remember doing God's will? Or do you remember, ah, this is hard, this is terrible. Do you remember the scorching heat? Oh, was Jesus. Not much for you. Because I think at all times, we're a little like point one. We understand where now other people are coming from. The call. The call. There's a caution. You don't want an evil eye. I don't want an evil eye. Help us when we have an evil eye. Help us to see light. The calling. Realize the blessing and deliverance that's going on here in what's at stake. Hey, a scripture that goes with this is the, the story of Jonah. You know, Jonah says at the end, I knew you were going to be nice to these people, God. And I couldn't stand it. Jonah, God
got out of a lawn chair and an umbrella to watch destruction. And God turns up in his nights and says to Jonah, My God, Jonah, I have pity on these people. I love these people. And the book of Jonah ends. We never know if Jonah gets happy or not. God's happy. I'm not so sure about Jonah. Realize the blessing and deliverance that happened here. They had not been hired. They were in desperate shape. They had no Lord and Savior. They were, they were sunk. And there's a calling here to empathy. For us to empathize with the desperateness of their situation. Empathy can be hard sometimes. Empathy is not sympathy. You know, sympathy, well, at least, at least, if ever somebody says to you, at least, it's not empathy. You know, I know you're one son's family, but at least the other one's on the others program. You know, it's a, mm. empathy is understanding what somebody else is going through. And then rejoicing, as the Bible says, rejoice with those who rejoice when they get out of, when they get blessed. In a passive way, the calling can be that. Let God be God. It's not my job to be God. Amen? Amen. <laughs> the active way in our calling is to actually rejoice. Jonah must have been quite a preacher. I mean, then people turn around. I mean, they proclaim the fast. And a lot of it is Jonah's, Jonah's fault. Because God uses him in a miraculous way. Help us, Lord. Help us, Jesus, to enjoy, to have joy at what you do, God. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this, for, for this parable. And the invitation that's here. Lord, help us to let you be God and do it the way you want to do it. And even to use us. And Lord, help us to enjoy. Even to enjoy. To have joy in what you were doing. At the same time, knowing, Lord, that sometimes we're painfully human. As our dear friend Fletcher said many years ago, God, when we disagree with you, help us in our disagreement. It's in your name we pray. Help us, Lord. And, Lord, we thank you that you are such a gracious land. It's in your name we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 Let's sing together a beautiful